Hello, I'm Daniel Meyer, Artistic Director of the Westmoreland Symphony, and I'm here with our soloist, Blake Pouliot, who will be joining us here on stage in Greensburg, downtown at the beautiful Palace Theater, and he's performing the music of Max Bruch, and it's the wonderful Scottish fantasy. Welcome, Blake. It's great to have you playing with the Westmoreland Symphony for the very first time. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to, to be there. Listen, I wanted to start off with something like a real softball. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Do you remember when you were a little kid, the first time that you heard an orchestra or heard a violin play and think, hmm, this is something I might want to do myself? Absolutely. Well, I, I absolutely do. I don't remember it personally, but I remember it because my parents have relayed the story to me over and over. Apparently, um, I went to see the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, which is where I was born and raised up in Toronto. And I, I think either there was a solo violinist playing or it was a concertmaster playing a solo. Um, but apparently I listened to it and told my parents after the concert that the violin was the coolest sound I'd ever heard and I really wanted to pursue it. And uh, at the time I was also playing piano. I was about five years old and uh, I was also you know, I'm, I'm from Canada, so I was also playing hockey, of course, and I was doing a lot of other extracurricular activities. And so my parents said no. They thought it was just kind of like a phase of me wanting, you know, being really ambitious, wanting to do everything. But I asked them for two years. And so finally, when I was seven years old, they got me some violin lessons. And uh, I just, I've been playing ever since. That's so, so amazing. And then, of course, you probably had some really wonderful mentors over your uh, over your period of, of learning the violin and, and discovering you know how you can express yourself with that instrument. Can you think of a teacher that really made a huge impact on you or, or to this day, you still kind of hear his or her voice in the back of your head when you're practicing? Absolutely. I mean, my uh, teacher in college was uh, the great uh, profound violin teacher and pedagogue, uh, Robert Lipset, who teaches at the uh, Colburn School and Conservatory in Los Angeles, California. And uh, he he was just a remarkable individual. I mean, he taught me to, you know, when we whenever we learn an instrument, I mean, or whenever we learn any particular craft, you know, there are always so many angles to approach things from. And I think that personally, I uh, my other first violin teacher, her name was Marie Berard, and she was the principal uh, concertmaster of um, the Canadian Opera Company. And I, studying with her as a kid, I really learned, she taught me to experiment with the kind of musical um, integrity and, and experiment with whatever my own artistic instincts were. Um, but then I also really wanted someone to kind of buckle down on the technical aspects and the fundamental kind of parts of violin playing. And my teacher, Robert Lipson in college, really kind of helped me finesse all of those things. Um, and his dedication to his students is just really remarkable. I mean, I not only was he there teaching us, I had lessons at least twice a week, but he, you know, he was the type of teacher. He was very old school and the way that he invested in his students, particularly those who were pursuing solo careers. And I mean, when I had my debut with the Dallas Symphony, with the Montreal Symphony, you know, he, he out of pocket would cancel all of his lessons, all of his commitments at school, and he would fly with me to these oh, orchestras and come there incredible. for first rehearsal. I mean, yeah, really, really remarkable individual. And I'm forever grateful for all of his uh, tutelage. Well, that's th those are the kind of mentors that we'll treasure and, and hold for the rest of our lives and, and shape us as musicians. It's wonderful that you've had those experiences. Uh, let's fast forward to your appearance here with the Westmoreland Symphony and talk a little bit about the Bruch. Is this a piece that you've played for a long time or something that you've just added to your repertoire? What is it about this piece that's so attractive to you? Uh, so, yes and no. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I have a very kind of interesting launch into solo violin playing just because, you know, I graduated my um, studies at school in 2019. So, I mean, I only really just got launched before I really kind of started performing and, you know, everything kind of started happening. Um, and the Scottish fantasy was one of the last pieces I actually studied with my teacher, Robert Lipset in school. Um, I was first asked to perform it with the Vancouver Symphony, I believe back in 2017 or so. Um, and I mean, I was completely just in love with the piece, like from the first time I heard it. Um, I yielded to it for a long time. I never decided to pick it up personally, just because um, 
it's really hard. <laughs> and uh, I was a little, you know, daunted by its difficulty, but I, I always was just so enamored with the, the, the tunes that come with it. And I find that it's a really special piece of music. So I really kind of got it at the end of my studies, but since then um, I've performed it many times and it's become definitely one of my favorite pieces to, uh, to connect with and to make music with. Yeah, it's a funny piece because, you know, no one first thinks about it in terms of its tech technical virtuosity or it's or how hard it is to play uh, yeah. because everybody's so swept away by the melodies it's such a gorgeous storytelling kind of piece that that has all these beautiful melodies strung one right after the next but no one ever necessarily first thinks about the technical demands on the piece but but it's got everything absolutely no couldn't agree more i mean i think that's part of the reason for me it is so difficult is that um i mean you know in very kind of simple violinistic terms, which people, you know, who don't play the instrument wouldn't necessarily think of. But uh, any, most violin concertos, if you look at them, you know, for people who don't uh, see these, they'll notice that a lot of violin concertos are written in D major or G, or, you know, they kind of, they're all related to the open strings of the instrument. And uh, what I respect a lot about Bruch is that uh, he didn't want to do that. He didn't care about respecting the open strings. He wanted to honor the key to match kind of the atmosphere and the mood of the tune of the folk tune that he was representing. So the piece itself is constantly written in flat keys and all these accidentals, which make it more difficult. But also, like you said, I mean, I think that sometimes the more simple it is, the more difficult because you don't want to get in the way of these lush kind of gorgeous melodies by uh, interrupting it with any technical difficulties. So you have to work twice as hard to make it flow and make it just sound, you know, kind of like a peasant song, you know, like it's just rolling out there. And I think that that's kind of the, the challenge of it sometimes, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And part of bringing forth these folk melodies and bringing out the dance quality of it is the instrument you're going to be using. Uh, tell us a little bit about your instrument. You have a, a very special violin. Yes, I do. I have a very special violin. Um, it is a 1729 Granaria Stil Jesu. So for those who, you know, are fascinated by the kind of history of violin and luthiers, is that um, most people know the kind of renowned luthier Stradivarius. But um, for those who are a little bit more kind of history buffs or really understand a lot of string players and the, the instruments themselves, Renaria Stel Jesu is kind of our other creme de la creme maker. Um, so it was made in Cremona, like I said, in 1729. Um, I originally uh, had it from, uh, you, you know, there's a program in Canada that allows us to compete and uh, they have a selection of specific rare instruments that we can borrow and that were lent for a term uh, of time, which are about three years. And I um, was really fortunate to be the winner of that of that um, competition. And so I was able to use this instrument for a while. Um, and after using it for many years, uh, I was then kind of things shifted and uh, the people who owned it decided to go in a different direction. And so now I, I have it lent to me exclusively, not part of that program, but that's how I was met with it. But um, it's almost 300 years old. Um, and I mean, it's just, I mean, there's a reason why it is not only so, uh, sought of after to use and, and, uh, buy, but, um, it's very expensive too. And, uh, there, there's a reason why, I mean, you know, it's a living antique and I'm thrilled every day I get to play with it. What are its specific characteristics that you particularly love or are attracted to? I think that, uh, again, with when comparing kind of the two greatest makers of violins between Stradivarius and Del Jesu, a lot of people, we have this debate between violinists of what draws us to one or the other. And I think the number one thing that I'm drawn to about my particular instrument is that um, most people would also kind of say when they listen to it that the tones of this instrument are a lot darker, they're a lot richer um, I describe it kind of like if you like a dark roast coffee versus a light roast coffee. Um, my instrument in particular, the low register really sings and it just kind of carries into a hall, into a big space. Um, and again, unlike Stradivarius, uh, in my own opinion, 
Stradivarius violins are almost like a laser beam. You don't really need to try very hard. They're going to sound marvelous. They're going to carry in a giant room. They're going to project, and they just sound wonderful. Um, the Granarius Jesus, they don't really do that. They don't respond the same way. You have to really learn how to manipulate it better. But I find that it has a much bigger threshold because of that. And I find that the ability to experiment and um, adventure into new sounds and new qualities is a little bit easier. And for me, that was just something that I, I really liked to lean into and that I found uh, more fascinating. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for sharing some of those thoughts on your instrument. That's it. It's it's amazing the different colors that you can pull out of a, a distinct instrument, and and just the way that each one responds is completely different. And uh, I'm grateful for you, grateful to you for sharing that. And we're thrilled that you're going to be joining us here in Greensburg and making your Westmoreland Symphony debut with the music of Max Bruch. Uh, Blake Pouliot, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we just can't wait to work with you very soon. Yes, thank you for having me. I can't wait to be there and work together.